uh, SOAS Middle East Institute, which is uh, hosting this event. Um, and I also welcome uh, Nargis Persad, who is the chair of the Center for Iranian Study, who helps arrange uh, the, uh, the talks on Tuesday evening. Uh, but most importantly, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, Victoria Britton to talk about her book, uh, which I have a copy of, which is Love and Resistance in the Films of May Masri. Um, it's a, a very exciting uh, book, and uh, I really recommend anyone who's interested in questions related to Palestine, uh, to women, to uh, to film production, to media production uh, in and about Palestine, uh, to read it. Without further ado, I just want to briefly introduce Victoria. Uh, she's a British uh, journalist and uh, author. Uh, she has lived and worked in Africa, in the US and Asia, and she has worked for The Guardian for 20 years as an associate foreign editor. Uh, she's a campaigner for human rights uh, throughout the develop developing world, and she has contributed widely to many other international publication, uh, publications, writing particularly on Africa and uh, the US and the Middle East. In the 1980s, she worked uh, closely with the anti-apartheid movement interviewing activists from the United Democratic Front and the Southern African Liberation Movements. She has written many books and she has co-authored uh, some books with um, other uh, writers. Uh, she also was a consultant uh, to the United Nations on the impact of conflict on women, also the subject of a research paper for the London School of Economics. She has written plays uh, which I didn't know, know that, or just discovered that <laughs> about Victoria. She is a woman of many secrets and many talents. It's really exciting to have her here. And she was a founder member of the annual Palestine uh, Festival of Literature in 2008. And importantly, she is a trustee of the Palestine Book Awards, where I had the pleasure to be with her on a, a couple of panels. Um, as of 2020, uh, Victoria is chair of Declassified UK, investigative journalism organization focusing on UK foreign military and uh, intelligence policies. We welcome you here, Victoria, and thank you so much for giving us your time. And I hope you know you're going to talk uh, for about 10 to 15 minutes, and then uh, I invite all uh, the attendees to send questions via the chat box and we can collect them and we can answer them. I might have a couple of questions to ask uh, uh, Victoria, uh, but welcome and thank you so much. We're looking forward to your uh, you know, brief introduction about the book and uh, over to you. All right, thank you very much, Dina. And thank you everyone for coming to this evening's discussion. And thank you, of course, to the SOAS Middle East Institute and Narges for hosting us and especially Dina for discussing the book and having the idea. And of course, to Aki for all the technology and links, which is such a challenge to some of us who don't do it all the time. I want to say that I owe Dina actually another debt. I later discovered that she was one of the four anonymous peer reviewers of my proposal to the publishers. And I'm quite sure she was that very warm and enthusiastic one who said, I would certainly want my students to read this book. And that may have um, persuaded the publishers they wanted to do it. But I want to start with the genesis of the book because it was not my idea. It's more than three and a half years since I received an email from somebody unknown to me asking me if I'd like to write a book about May Masri. I said yes, immediately. I didn't stop to think about how I was actually going to do it or what it would mean to be working for an academic publisher. My previous publishers had been very different style, much more cozy, Faber and Faber and Fluto. And my books were based in a wholly different world, the world of 10 years of living and working in Africa in the dying years of the Cold War and of the apartheid regime in South Africa. But why did I say yes so quickly? Because I knew May. And I'd seen four of her indelible films over a 30 year period, which was in fact about the same time span as I had been gradually more and more often visiting and writing about Palestine and the refugee camps 
in Lebanon and Syria. So I just knew this was my perfect project. And I was right. It's been a very rich three more plus nearly four years. I feel I've been living inside these dozen films and alongside their brave and impressive protagonists and inside this long, tragic and dramatic history. And most importantly, living inside May's mind, which I learned in our long, long walks and talks in Beirut and in London. So I owe a great debt of thanks to the two filmmakers and academics, Samira al Qasim and Nezar Andari, for asking me, a complete stranger to them, to write this book as part of their important series on Arab filmmakers. Theirs was the first book, and mine is number three, and I think two more may be in production now. And we've never met us three. But from their different worlds in the United States and the UAE, and me in London, they couldn't have given me more generous support with critiques and ideas and an important friendship for me. Of course, I really wish tonight that we were all together, everyone who's, who's listening to this, and Samira and May, of course, and um, Nazar, and we were watching one of May's films here, and then we were going to have a discussion and share our thoughts and maybe go for dinner. Maybe it will happen another time. But what I can do for now, I hope, is that I can give you a taste of these really beautiful, meticulous, original works of art. So I want to start with the themes which attracted me to writing about these body of unusual documents which span more than 40 years. And of course, as well as the documentaries, the award-winning feature film, um, which came out in 2015, 3000 Nights, some of you might have seen it. It opened the London Film Festival that year. All May's work is related and it's linked. I think of it being like a quilt or a collage or a tapestry with many different layers. And as you watch them, you begin to recognize individual women and you see them age in different films and appearing in different contexts. And the four themes I want to highlight are these. First of all, inspirational women. Who doesn't love them? Secondly, the resistance by communities of seemingly ordinary people to injustice. Third, the surviving of incarceration. And lastly, and above all, memory. Memory and its precious role in building identity and in the face of more than 100 years of the attempted destruction of Palestine and Palestinian identity, memory is the most important thing. And on this last point, these films of May's have a very poignant importance, given the looting by the Israeli army of the Palestine Cinema Institute in Beirut and the seizing of the entire archive by the army during the 82 invasion. In fact, this was just part of a policy of rubbing out of Palestinian history, which goes back to 1948. And it was revealed in detail by Dr. Rona Sella, talking of inspiring women, of Tel Aviv University, who put 10 years of research and efforts into declassifying Palestinian material, which was being held as inaccessible as Israeli military material. Anyway, May's films cannot replace what's lost, but they do highlight that loss in the way that they reveal, taken all together, a historical documentation of these years, which is of absolutely unique value. So May and her dear late husband and close colleague, the Lebanese film director, Jean Chamoun, they were on the ground filming in almost all the key moments of these, this period. And so the films span both political and personal experiences, actually of indescribable horror. Of course, most of you are all probably far too familiar, but I'll just give you the span. 
from the siege and bombing of Beirut by Israel in 82, and then the massacre of 2,000 Palestinian civilians in the camps of Sabra and Shatila, then on to 87 and the first intifada and the uprising in Gaza and the West Bank of children and Palestinian youth armed with stones against the Israeli army. And alongside this, we have to remember Israel's 22 year occupation of South Lebanon, all in the films and the liberation from it in the year 2000. And then of course, there's the next Israeli attacks on Lebanon in 2006. And throughout all these years, there's a background, which is the normalization of torture, of exile, of disappearances, of assassinations. These are the inescapable background of Palestinian life. But exceptionally, in these films, all this overwhelming in violence is actually seen through the eyes of children and the lives of children and through these iconic women. And for me, love, kindness and beauty are the hallmarks of these people and of these scenes. And hence my title, Love and Resistance in the Films of May Masri. I have to tell you, I thought of that title in Beirut before I'd written a word, but I'd been talking to May and meeting people and so on. And I rather shyly tried it out on one of May's daughters. And she said, oh, that's brilliant. I thought, right, I'm done. It's often difficult to think of a title, but I was so happy with it. I'm still happy with it. Now, one of May's running themes, which it's so important to register in the unity of, of her work is the transmission of oral history to Palestinian children from older generations, elderly neighbors, shrewd wounded fighters, parents released from years, decades in prison. And the children she chose for the films are revealed living in their childish dreams and imagination, reading from their private diaries and sometimes painting together a brilliant panorama of Palestine filled with birds and flowers. And then a brilliant touch by May, filming each other, filming their hopes and ambitions on digital cameras, which she gave to them. This is very patient work. And in the long, long gestation of many of these films, what that patience was building was trust. The word trust, trust of May and Jean was emphasized to me by so many people I listened to, not only participants in the films, but Lebanese and Palestinian critics and observers over the years. May is an insider in these lives and the intimacy of the Palestinian family scene she shows is absolutely unique. I remember the Lebanese critic May Hamadi one of the first people I interviewed when I was trying to get started and how I was going to do it, I was researching it. And she said to me, no one, no one has opened the camp experience to the outside world as May has done. Never forget that is unique. Well, I sure know that now. Anyway, the participants in the films, I met them in the camps in Beirut, all over South Lebanon, and then weirdly on Skype in all sorts of different countries, like, well, all sorts of places inside Palestine, but also places like Germany, France, Switzerland. Um, and all of them almost always told me that they've never thought of wanting to be in any kind of a film. But if it was May and Jean, it wasn't like being interviewed. It was like chatting with friends. And decades later, these people wanted to talk to me about the book because I came to their houses with May or May got them on the phone while I was there. She's completely in their lives even now. And I want to give you one example of this. One of the little girls, school girls um, from the 2005 film Frontiers 
uh, of Dreams and Fears, or Tamara, went on to become a filmmaker because of May. And she told me once that she had actually filmed some images for May to use in 3000 Nights, the prisoner release um, in, in Ramallah, the Makata. And she said to me, you know, for me, it touched me so deeply to do this because my father had been 18 years in prison. So going to film him to be in a film of May's was like a dream. Anyway, it's a mark of how May and her work is valued by so many people that the book has got photographs and paintings and poetry donated for inclusion by some of the most distinguished of Palestinian and Lebanese artists, Samir Halabi and Eamon Balbeke, then the poet Natalie Handel and the Lebanese photographers Ramzi Haida and Marwan Tata. And I'm enormously grateful for these gifts. I hope I'm now going to show you a few photos from the book because it will give you a taste of the films and also how they overlap, overlap with these powerful work by artists working in another genre. So here I go with my share screen, I hope. Oh, I don't think I've shared it, have I? Yeah. Yes, you have. Have I? Oh, good. Yeah, you've just got to. Yeah. Oh, there's the first one. Okay, this is from 3000 Nights. I'm sure some of you have seen it. And this is... Oh, it says that sharing is paused. Is it okay? Are you seeing it? Uh, no, we can't. Okay, you are viewing... Can you, can you try again? Okay, it's... It says, bring your shared window to the front. Resume share. Let me try. Can you see my screen now? Yeah, we can't see the screen, but we can see yeah. it. When I press the picture. So we can see your desktop. I think if you, um, you know, open the film and then if you go to share screen and you should see a thumbnail of that. So if you come out of share if you're in it i am in so should i come out of share yes come out of share stop share yeah okay and then and then i think maybe open uh, what you're going to show um if you can and then click on share screen again and then you should see a thumbnail of you know everything on your desktop etc and then click on it and click share okay um, but you don't want me to share screen now. We do, yeah. Or yeah, oh, you could do it now. Go, go to share screen. Press share okay. screen. Press I've done share. that. Okay. What do you see on your uh, computer now that you have? You, you see a little range of stuff on your... Yes, I do. Okay. And then click on what you um, uh, want the on that. The untitled photo, um, folder. Okay. I'm clicking on the folder, right? Okay. And that's, there we are. And now open it or whatever. I mean, you can now uh, double click or whatever you're going to do on it. Yeah, exactly. I so think that's what I did. Let me try it again. Okay. Yeah, so double click on it. I did double click. Oh, now I, okay. can, I can see okay. it, but you can't. And uh, uh, No, we can't <laughs> see. Is it an image? Is it a moving image or is it just photograph? It's photographs and it says the sharing is paused. Oh, bring, I wonder. Your, bring your shared window to the front. I'm um, not sure what that means. Um, it worked when I did it with Aki just Yes, now. I know. I know. Well, maybe, I mean, can you, before, if you go out of share again, can yeah. you, can you, um, can you open that image? You know, click, double click on the image so it's, you know, the uh, full size that you want to show us. Okay, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm, yeah, going, to, I'm going to show you some different images, which, oh no. Okay. Yeah, okay, L let me give up my very ambitious. Okay. Just, <laughs> just give you. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to give you this one. Now, can you see that? 
if you I, try I, sharing the screen again, I, I've stopped recording from the cloud, so okay, it should so work now. Yeah. So shall I make this small again? Um, if you go to um, share screen, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to show you this now. Yeah. Yeah, it's working perfectly. Okay. Um, okay. So you can see um, you can see Leal and and Noor in in prison. And can you hear me? All right. Uh, yeah, we can see that and okay. hear you. Yeah. And you can see the film. Okay, so yeah. this is this is from the feature film Three Thousand Nights, and Leal is a school teacher um, who, for complicated reasons, nothing to do with politics, ends up completely wrongly serving an eight-year sentence. She has this baby, Noor, um, and he is indeed the light of her life. And at the two years old, um, he's taken away from her. And she spends the next eight years, um, the next six years in prison until she's um, out. Let me show you, I hope I can then show you the next one. Sorry to be a bit rubbish at this. Um, no problem at all. <laughs> Okay, this, so I want, I hope this is going to work. Can you see that? No. Yes, we can. Yes. So this is the, um, forget the London Film Festival. This was the most important showing of 3000 Nights. It took place in Shatila Camp. And that's beautiful May on the right, the taller person. And the, the showing was, it was absolutely packed. And the person on the left, is called Kifa Afifi, who is a complete heroine of all sorts in Shatila and all over Palestine, in fact. And she's a, one of these recurring women in many of May's films. And I hope I'm going to show you a very different, see that, remember that face of Kifa. Sorry, I'm a bit slow. Um, yes. Now, do you see this? This mm -hmm. is Kifar in the actual prison cell that she spent so many years in, in Kiam prison in South Lebanon, um, while it was occupied by the Israelis. And there's this unforgettable line that she, she says in the film um, when she says, I died a hundred deaths every day in this prison. Anyway, she she's just a complete heroine. I won't say more. Um, that's Kifar. As I'm taking a long time, I'm going to show you less films, less pictures, but I'm going to show you. Um, I want to show you this one. I can't not show you this one. This is the year 2000, when the Israeli army has just withdrawn. And this is the barbed wire between Lebanon, this side, and Palestine. And you can see the Israeli um, watchtower at the back. And this is a brother and sister who haven't seen each other for 52 years. And they're meeting that day. This is such a fantastic film, Frontiers. And I'm going to show you one more, rather similar to that, but totally different. I hope I've got it. Yes, this is the same day and the same place. And you have got children, Palestinian children, who've come down from uh, Shatila. And on the other side, you've got children who've come from Dehesha camp outside of Bethlehem. And they had been pen pals and had also been linked by seeing each other on Skype and things like that, but had never ever imagined for a second that they were going to meet. And it was just a day of absolutely overwhelming 
joy, emotion, um, completely extraordinary captured in, in, in this film. Um, and I want to show you one more thing if I get my act together. Oh no, that's wrong. Um, I want to show you this. This is a painting, a monumentally huge painting by the Lebanese artist, Eamon Balbaki. And it's a painting of the Barakat buildings, also sometimes known as Beit Beirut, which is on Damascus Road, just on the green line of the 15 year civil war. And it's just an amazing evocation of what happened to Beirut in that period. And it's now called uh, a museum of memory. So I keep bringing up memory. And it's in May's 2005 um, film called Beirut Diaries. It's very, very central to the film. Um, and I just want to tell you that the first ever exhibition that was held in this museum was on the 17,000 um, disappeared civilians of the, um, of the Lebanese uh, civil war. And if you've got the patience to just see one more thing, which is another painting. This is a painting by Samia Halabi, the totally revered Palestinian um, painter. And it's a painting that she did in 2017 of Ghassan Kanafani. As I'm sure most of you know, he was assassinated by the Israelis um, on the 8th of July in 72. And he was a poet and a writer. And I think the way she's done it, you've got this peaceful but determined face in this sea of poppies and different Palestinians of, of all ages and, and all sorts. And I love looking at this picture. And I love the fact that in his obit in Lebanon's Daily Star, it said, he was a commando who never fired a gun, whose weapon was a ballpoint pen, and his arena was the newspaper pages. I think these are perfect words. And on that note, I'll stop sharing and um, go over to Dina. Okay, thank you very much. So if you kind of come back to the screen. I hope I have. Okay. Yes. Um, all right. So, uh, oops, hold on just one second. Um, I just was very intrigued by your talk because it, it kind of opened more questions in my mind than I had originally thought I wanted to ask you. Um, and one of the questions was around the question of memory. You talked about memory. Um, and you talked about the films as being a form of maybe memory or an archive of memory. Um, and I want you to kind of talk about that and talk about the selection of films that you chose for this book um, and how you see that uh, kind of coming through um, the question of memory and why it is important uh, to talk about memory in the Palestinian case. Oh, hard question, Dina. Um, well, I, I, I mean, so many things that I learned listening to people um, made me realize how much uh, memory is what Palestinians of all different age groups thrive on and, and live on. And the more I learned about the, um, the terrible story of the, uh, of the archive, and I realized that it was, like a, uh, it was like a wound for people, that that kind of heroic period of the 60s, 70s, that was on those quite rough films, because actually some, um, some reels of those films were taken out during 82 in people's handbags and some were actually in Italy where they were being um, uh, they were being worked on at the time 
So you can see some little fragments of those films, but it's like a, that somebody tried to rub out the history. And it's such an incredibly dramatic and outrageous thing that um, to, to, to try to understand its emotional impact. And there's a, there's a scene in, in um, Children of Shatila, just after May's given them these little digital cameras. And there's this bunch of kids and they, they go down to an elderly neighbor and, and they, 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 they're kidding around and filming each other. And then they get to him and he's a very old man. And they say to him, um, tell us, um, what was it like when you left Palestine? Mm -hmm. And he's really serious with them and he says, we were a very poor and shabby lot and lots, we had no shoes. It was terrible. And then, he, then, they say, then they say to him, you know, the little kids, they said to him, so when you go back to Palestine, what's the first thing that you will do? And he very seriously says, well, of course I look after my land. It's the most important thing. And you look at the faces of the kids because some of the kids are filming him and some of the kids are filming each other. And in the film, she very cleverly shows all these different things. And then he says to them at the end, he says, I want you to promise me one thing, that however long it takes and however old you are, when you're old like me, you'll still remember that Palestine is your life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, it's like, as for an outsider, it's so poignant and so strong and then when I tried to explain about how I feel that her films are all interlinked um, and they're interlinked with her life and they're interlinked with the lives of so many of these protagonists who, who come back, you know, they have babies and they ring her up and say, oh, I'm having own, I've got a new baby or I've done my PhD or I'm doing, and it's like that they, they, they have, they have formed a kind of living Palestine, even when they're in, in exile. I may be not being very clear, and maybe to any Palestinian listening, it's so bleeding obvious what I'm saying, but I'm just trying to answer the question. Well, you've, you've answered it, but I've got another quick question in relation to that, which is, again, the title, Love and Resistance, uh, in a way, uh, because, it, you know, in a sense, um, you bring that out very nicely in the chapters and the way you write. Uh, and it comes through the narrative very clearly. And also, of course, um, the love and resistance in the films, you know, what is what are the films about? But one way I was trying to think about it is also about life. Um, so in a sense, uh, you know, and it links to the idea of memory and about lived lives and about lived experiences and remembering and so on. And I wondered whether that was something you thought about as you were looking at those films and you're trying to, you know, speak with them and speak with other people about them. And of course, my features uh, really very well through your eloquent uh, different chapters, you know, each chapter sits on its own somehow. Uh, but they're all interlinked by this, you know, by, by the theme that you put through, which is love and resistance. But for me, it was, you know, it's about life, you know, and I wondered whether you thought about that in a way or as you kind of uh, look back at the films and so on, how, how does that? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's just a complete description of, of what I felt. And mm. I mean, you know, Kifa is a, is such a, an example of, of that. And, you know, when you, you're, you're sitting with her in her room and she's talking about all these experiences, which you know about because you've seen the films or mm. you've, you know, you've read the books of other prisoners. And, and there she is, this jolly woman, you know, talking about teenagers and life. Um, mm. And then, you know, joking about her husband and there was another title I thought about for half a second because I thought it was funny. She's talking about her husband. She said, um, of course, he was in the, in the men's part of Hiam. And um, we had put this black cloth behind the window. Um, and so we could, we could kind of get reflected to each other. And, you know, there was I in my handcuffs 
flirting away with him in my handcuffs. And I thought, you know, this is a woman who is so amazingly indomitable. Mm -hmm. And, and all, all, all the women who, who speak about that time, and then you see them playing with their children and talking about family life and friends and love and it's just, it's the whole the whole ensemble of the books is an affirmation of life exactly. against against everything that's being done to crush it so can i ask a more general question so um it's really important that we have books like this out and it's really important that we have you know a reflection or uh, kind of a, you know, to bring to outside audiences lives of Palestinians and the need to make the voices visible. And I think May has done that through all her films and it's, it's very important. But I wanted to ask, you know, having, um, you know, been involved in South Africa and, you know, kind of anti-apartheid and so on, do you have, you know, you know, looking at the lives and the kind of the um, the ways in which Palestinians have lived through different stages and different experiences and different Nakabas or whatever we can call them, we want to call them. Um, do you see, do you see some, you know, do you kind of somehow, uh, do you feel that there is some similarity or do you think that's a very simplistic way of looking at it? No, it's not simplistic at all. There are some, definitely a lot of similarities. And there are also a lot of very obviously very, very different things. But I think in a way, um, my incredible luck was that I had had the Southern African experience and I was staying always in Angola, which was a country completely crushed by the American and Zaire as the Democratic Republic of Congo was called then and white South Africa had really brought this country to its knees. And what I had seen there, I think of, um, resilience is always the wrong word because it's too small, but of, of people who embraced beauty, um, whether they were um, artists or poets or one particular um, family who were um, assassinated by um, by UNITA, um, who ran a, uh, a research, agricultural research center, which was full of the most amazing, beautiful, beautiful flowers. And, and it was that what beauty gives you. Mm. And, and also, I would have to say that from the experience of the Cuban doctors in particular, and school teachers, who, who often did two or three tours in Angola when goodness, it was tough. Um, but they, they were just exuberant. They just managed to be exuberant. Mm -hmm. And I am um, around Kifar and many other of May's uh, friends. Um, I found that and I thought, you know, this, this is the secret of how you don't lose your humanity, however much somebody with a boot on your head is trying to make you lose it. Fantastic. So, I, yeah, I mean, that's why I say these rich years, lucky me. Yes, I can say that. I want to see whether there, are, there seems to be a question in the question and answer. And it's a question from Alia Zayed. Uh, she's asking, how can the Western world, particularly the media, highlight the agony, the deliberate erasing of memories, apart from the obvious everyday terror, terror of living under an occupation, without being labeled anti-Semitic? Um, it's a kind of a, a, you know, a big question. But I think just to put it in, in, in a nutshell, she's, she is, what, what that question is, is asking is, have you ever faced, or maybe by writing this book or something, will, will you be faced, do you think that you might be facing questions around you being anti-Semitic? I think it's a difficult topic to bring in the discussion because it's so broad, uh, but it was one of the questions that was put there. And I just feel I 
I have to ask you because I haven't seen other questions coming up. Okay. Well, um, well what can I say? You know, I'm not a communist, but I spent years being described as a communist in the Thatcher time because, because I was, you know, I wasn't, because I'm a reporter, I was reporting what I saw in Southern Angola and, and Mozambique, which was being done by the apartheid regime. And, uh, you know, people sling around these um, extremely uh, damaging kind of, um, um, well, they're kind of, well, they're insults for, you know, something that's meant to be damaging. But, you know, my, my job is I'm a reporter and I've been a reporter in this, in, in this book. All these things happened, and mm -hmm. and 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 what I what I, I want to, to 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 students to see is that it's it's a pattern. It's all of a thing together, and it's this this is a a kind of strand of life you have to know about. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of there's a lot of overwhelmingly negative, as I have said. But through these films, you can see um, the overwhelmingly positive. That is human beings. Which links to another question just just come up, which, which is asking about the, the demographic, uh, you know, the main demographic in uh, my Muslims films, but also how effective do you think film is in raising awareness of the conflicts that are currently going on, particularly in the case of Palestine, as opposed to other media? So whether you can comment, do you think that film uh, you know, in particular, can uh, can make visible hidden conflicts. So, what is your uh, yeah? I, abs I absolutely do think it can, um, but of course, I mean the, the 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 main thing is is that films have to be seen, and films. I mean that 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 may open the London Film Festival was fabulous, but you know which British cinema then ran that film. And I think that it's so, the film is so powerful. And when I see the kind of reception that uh, May's films get all over the world, you know, whether it's Tunisia or India or Egypt, you know, you know, she's like a rock star. They think, oh my God, this woman has shown us this amazing things. And, and in France, actually, one of her producers is French. And although there's been some opposition to her films being shown, she has film festivals in France where people queue to get in. And, and people, it, it opens people's minds and people's hearts. They love it. Mm. So yes, I mean, I wish I wasn't a writer in a way. I wish I was a filmmaker because unless you're Darwish or somebody, you know, Darwish on 1982, uh, that amazing book that he wrote, you know, yeah. their words really work. But for most people to just most journalists or ordinary writers to describe these things has nothing like the impact of what you see in these films. Yeah, that's true. Um, I don't know whether there are any questions. Aki, can you give us some questions? Are you getting any questions from elsewhere? Um, no, there's nothing else on, on, on Facebook. And I'm waiting here on the question and answer to see whether there are any questions. This is a, a you know a, a difficult way of, of kind of having a discussion because you have to wait until something comes up, and maybe people are unable to um, to pose their questions. Um, but can I ask you a question, Dina? Yes. Well, while we're waiting for another question, I, I want to ask you. That you, you know, you're a teacher in, in SOAS, so, and I'm sure that in your classes you have a cross section of students who are, who know a lot, maybe they're Palestinian or from the region, and then students from all over the world who don't know much and are just there for curiosity. How do you think that these films would, would play in, in that kind of student group, which is something I'm very, very interested in? Well, it's a good question, but I think so as is, you know, I, I teach postgraduate students, so they, oh, okay. would have had, they would have had, they would probably have had an interest 
uh, in understanding and analyzing film and, and the media in different ways. And that's why they come and do the, the courses at SOAS. And they're also interested in the voices coming from what we call the global south. Um, the voices and the uh, images and the representations coming from Asia, Africa and the Middle East. So we have a lot of, you know, kind of material. I think, you know, if we, it, it, it's a very good, uh, first of all, your book is really good for kind of making people think about issues in a different way. So you can say, uh, why don't we use um, a classroom situation where we can see one of those films and then have them uh, kind of comment on what are the angles, what are the themes that come up. Um, and I think it's for me as, as a, a teacher, it is important to have such material, particularly um, related to women, um, Palestinian women kind of uh, showing uh, the lives of Palestinians as they are. I, I myself, you know, would love to be able to write a sequel to my first book, um, in a sense, about Palestinian memory and, you know, kind of ex lived experiences of particular events in Palestinian lives. But if you come to the question of, um, again, what type of questions does it raise, and, the, and, and particularly in the current moment, which is the COVID moment, where we have, you know, a situation where um, there, you know, what is happening in Palestine, as in many other parts of the world, is almost inv invisible right now, because we have the concentration on, you know, the big picture. Uh, and also the little picture, which is the national picture. Well, how are we dealing with, with, the, with the crisis that we are in? And the bigger picture, which is the politics of, you know, whatever is happening in, in the American elections. But I can see I've got some questions coming up, um, which is a good question, which is what is the most challenging part of writing this book? Oh, that's not a difficult question. Um was a, the most difficult thing was um, was feeling that it's so overwhelmingly um, complex and serious and important. Um, can I possibly do it justice? And have I got the have I have I understood enough to to be able to impart to readers um, what I really feel about it? And and I you know of course I don't really know the answer to that. At least I sort of do now because um, this the book had a, has had two wonderful reviews. One in French, very long one in. Um, uh, what's it called, Orient 21, um, by a Brazilian woman and who l has loved May's work for years. And she wrote this long, long appreciation of, of May. And then she wrote to me saying, um, you know, I've learned a lot of new things. So I thought, well, phew, there's that, I've got it over to somebody. And then the one in Arabic was, you know, written by a wonderful Iraqi, um, writer but um i can't tell um, until until i see some maybe some english people making a response um wh whether they people have have learned something have enjoyed it have but you know with covid how it is and not meeting people mm. um i think we'd, i just have to be patient to know whether i whether I, I did what I did, whether I, I, whether I did what I meant to do. So the yeah. challenge is still there. <laughs> did I pull it off? So I've got uh, a couple of more questions. One is asking uh, why, you know, why did you choose my Masri and why her films? And then asking where, where can they find the book in the Middle East, whether you have any idea whether it's being sold um, in, in parts of the Middle East. Um, and the other question that is quite challenging is um, is a question related to, you know, 
the, the, you know, in a sense, of, is there a difference between men's and women's memories? Um, and did you, f and I have a question related to that, which I will ask later. Um, but but the, question, the question coming from the audience also said that um, they, they watched a film once and there was a palpable sen sense of shame coming through in, in the discussion around Palestinian history and so on. So maybe you could contrast that with what you have seen in, in or what, what you think uh, may showed in the film. So the sense of shame or is a sense of pride or, or whatever. But that's a question coming from the audience. So you may want to not answer it, but, but basically you've got a couple of questions to answer. Okay. Well, let me answer the easier ones. Um, uh, why may? Well, as I said, I was not the one who, uh, who had the brilliant idea to do this book. I was just the one who got the lucky chance of, uh, of writing it. Um, uh, and I suppose why I never thought of doing it myself was I, I didn't think, uh, you know, I really had the, the, the background, you know, all my years in Africa, and all the times I went to Palestine um, and had, had been in Lebanon and so on, I didn't. I felt there were many people with much better qualifications to do that kind of something so big. Um, and then I think it was a question about where you can get the book. Um, well, you you can. Uh, people have got it from Amazon, um, but it takes quite a long time. Um, and then there is. There is a link. Maybe I could, um, maybe I can send you, Dina or Aki, um, a link to to Palgrave where you can get it. Um, but then the third option is that um, we're doing an event on the um, 13th of November in, um, you know, Dock House. Um, uh, they're doing an event in which they're showing a film. And then they're having a discussion with, with, with May and myself. Mm -hmm. And I know that uh, Palgrave are, uh, are making the book available through that at a 20% discount. So that's another thing you, you could do. But I will give the Palgrave link to Dina and to um, Aki, and maybe they can, um, they can give it to whoever, whoever is asking that question. Uh, and then, then there was a question, is there a difference between men's and women's memories? Mm -hmm. Did I get that right? Yes, um, well, yes, I would say there <laughs> is. Um, but when we're specifically talking about war, um, you know, I, I was a war correspondent for quite a long time in um, when in Vietnam and then a lot, a lot in different places in Africa, even before I went to Angola and Southern Africa. And um, I, I was always struck by um, the different ways that, um, that, that reporters related to different protagonists in the war um, and um, many of the reporters that I knew, um, male reporters, um, liked working in groups, liked socializing in groups, liked um, being embedded in a military unit and all of those things, I would rather have died than involved myself in any of that. And there were, there were only a few women reporters when I was there and they were all older than me and worked for the New York Times and such like. Um, so I didn't really know. What I can say about myself is that I had a completely different life. I, the memories I was listening to and experiences I was listening to were usually women like I would take my son to school and I would chat with the teachers and the other mums. So the whole different slice of life during a war was available to, to me. And actually, you know, 
in those days, of course, men were more daring in their um, being patronizing to women. And often people say, oh, do you do nice stories about orphans? Well, actually, yes, I did. Because that was the texture of life that I was interested in and going and being in a helicopter with a whole lot of American servicemen and then writing about that, it's just not my bag. So I think there's a huge difference in sensibility and memory as part of that. Mm. Um, and then the, I didn't quite understand the question about shame. Who, who is ashamed? Uh, I think the question was that uh, they, they saw a film that the, the person was asking, uh, so a film that somehow seemed to reflect the fact that some Palestinians are ashamed, but uh, it might not be, it, I don't think it's a question that, that might be relevant to our discussion now, uh, but in terms of the films of uh, May Masri, um, you know, the, there is a sense, I, I myself did not see a sense of shame uh, coming out in those films, but I don't know whether you could Okay, I, I think I get the question. I've, I've, read, I've read it now. I didn't, I didn't look at it. Yeah, um, I don't know what the, which film it was that you saw about released Palestinian prisoners. But um, let me tell you uh, what I think this may be related to. Um, one of my early big Palestinian uh, influences was um, Dr. Ayad Sarraj. Uh, Gaza's first and um, most distinguished psychiatrist. And um, I was uh, fortunate enough to, to work with him for quite a lot. And one time I stayed there for a while and he told me about how uh, difficult it is for men prisoners um, to come back into their families and they're ashamed because they haven't been there when the kids were growing up, especially the boys. Um, they have quite often lost their, their livelihood. And so they can't support their families. They have to see their wives doing it. Um, and then uh, in, in, in some cases, they, they had been left very uh, humiliated by the way that they had been treated in front of other people. Mm. And, and, and so a lot of his work was about, and he himself, Ayad, was actually uh, at one point arrested by the Palestinian uh, police and well, soldiers and, and beaten up and generally. And, and he describing this, he would say, you know, you, you are trying to humiliate me, but actually you are humiliating yourself. So when he was talking to this about, uh, talking to me about this whole area, um, it was something that is deliberately part of the tactics to try to make people, particularly men, feel that their manliness um, is somehow diminished. But on the other hand, if you've only got to see a, a, any of the footage of um, of men being released, like after the Gilad um, Shalit, you, you see these busloads of Palestinian men ar arriving and, you know, every granny and auntie and small child is adoring them and thanking them for their steadfastness and so on. So I, I, I wouldn't emphasize the shame. It, it, it's a it's a part of the, th of the whole very complex pattern about prisoners. But you're right that prisoners is, as May's films um, definitely demonstrate, um, an enormous part of the Palestinian experience. Mm. I uh, hope that's answered the question of, I think it was Paul. Yeah, yeah, I think Paul, Paul says yes. And I've got a question from uh, Ronnie Clinton, which is a really good question. Just, uh, she says that she hasn't seen, uh, she hasn't read the book, but she's seen uh, May Mustry's films. Um, and she's asking a, the question is, how does this relate, you know, how does all the discussion that we're having today, how does the, and, and the production of the films and the stories, how do they relate to the uh, ongoing racialization and colonization by Israel? Um, whether there is a connection there. 
Well, I think everything, everything relates to itself and to everything else. And in the present circumstances of, um, of what's happening in Palestine and what's happening to Palestinian uh, refugees in the region, think of this, the Palestinians who've come from Syria and the conditions they're living in in Lebanon. Um, every, uh, every affirmation of strength and beauty within very, very tough experiences is, is life enhancing and incredibly important. And, the, you know, that's why I, I would love May's films. I mean, I know they're shown a lot in the Arab world, a lot, a lot. Um, but, you know, I, I always hope that they're shown even more and that, that the students discuss with their teachers um, the, the, the very subtle um, layers of what's, of what's going on and people's responses to, the, to it. And I think, you know, the main thing, I, I mean, I mentioned Darwish, the main thing is like, you, you, you read Darwish and, you, and you, you, you feel not defeated. And there's actually, there's a, there's a chapter I wrote about, um, a, a film of my that's different. It's a film about um, uh, Hannah Nashrawi. Mm -hmm. And I called the film, I uh, called the chapter, I think I called it Keeping Going. And, you know, that's all part of what's so great about these films being out there and available for people to, to see and discuss and think about. But, but just to continue the comment, of, you know, the comment in relation to that question, in a sense, um, the fact that, you know, there is a Palestinian story to keep talking about relating to the ongoing kind of uh, events and what, what some people call the ongoing Nakba, the ongoing catastrophe of the Palestinians. In a sense, what, in a sense, uh, the films also reflect on the continued racialization and colonization of Palestine, which is not talked about in uh, the, the mainstream media in, 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 in much at all um, and it's kind of uh, pushed under under the, the rug uh, in different ways and I, th I think you know sort of um, writing a book like this and reflecting on the work of my master again uh, is a, a timely reminder of this continuous process of colonization which I hope was what the intention of the question was, but perhaps I kind of convoluted it. But maybe we can have uh, Ronit uh, send us another um, comment later on. Uh, but it's a very, very interesting question, which says, would you describe Masri's portrayal of Palestinian women's issues as a feminist one? Is this a feminist position? You know, the fact that you have a, a you know, uh, a focus on women, uh, can you, is it? a feminist uh, question? Well, there are so many different layers of, um, of uh, feminism. Um, I, I'm definitely a feminist. Um, and May is what I would, I've never actually had this conversation with her, but I'm sure she would probably also describe herself as a feminist in the sense that she's a very, and certainly all the young women who, who have worked with her um, as children in these films and then as her, her allies as they as they grow up have been empowered by by May's example and I think that's what feminism is is all about and I the same about Hanan I would certainly say that um, she, she again I've not had the conversation but in my definition of what is a feminist wow both of them you know really stand out and um I think it's very, very important role models. Mm. Uh, yeah, thank you for that comment. Uh, I wonder whether there are any questions. I think we've answered most of the questions that came in Q&A. Aki, if you can uh, send me a message to say whether we have any questions coming via Facebook. Not any on, on Facebook, we haven't got any questions. Um, 
but in a sense, if we go back to this idea of, you know, I wanted to push you a bit further on the feminist question, on the question of whether, you know, this is a feminist start, stance. Um, and I want, in a sense, to think about that question that says, are, are, men, are men's memories different than women's? Um, yeah. Because from my own perspective, you know, my own perspective, and I cannot be right, um, is that because you have a particular situation that is an overarching situation that is involves all Palestinians, whether it's men, women, children, young, old, whatever, um, that it can, you know, that the question of being a, a feminist activist or an activist becomes blurred. So I wondered whether you could talk about that in a sense. So. Uh, so you, you're an active, you know, you're an activist, but does for for a a, a situation, you know, a, a a a settler colonial situation that affects everyone in the same way. So I I wondered whether you could perhaps, um, you know, push put yourself back a little bit and think about yourself uh, as a woman activist or as an activist, you know. Do I make any sense in my question? Yeah, yeah, yeah you, yes, you do. Uh, but leaving me to one side for a moment. Um, I think there's, there's something very particular about the, um, the, the role of women in the Palestinian situation, which is to do with incarceration. That such a very, very large quantity of proportion of Palestinian men have spent years or decades in prison. The, the shape of the family is, uh, is, is a weight on women. And that's been the case all, all along, all along. And I think that it's, it's produced um, a kind of normalization of strong, independent, coping women, which is completely different from the trajectory of in, in a Western bourgeois society. And I find among the young Palestinian women that I know, um, uh, an, 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 an ease of, with taking responsibility for themselves and their incredibly complicated logistics of their lives. Everybody's life is so complicated. Can you live here? Can you marry someone? Who has a different identity card from you? Can you drive your car here? Can you get permission to go abroad to study? All of these things, Palestinian women and young women take up a weight of responsibility that is more than in uh, certainly in the, in the West we really appreciate, and I think that's important. But I think of another thing, that, a conversation that I had with May once about, um, uh, she was saying how very struck she was that in the, in the rush of post-Vietnam films, um, they're so blokey, you know, they're all about men. And, and, and you know, where, where, are, where are the women? And, um, and so it's it's definitely part of her perception that in in um, in in artistic work um, women need to be heard much more than they they are. Mm. Although things are obviously much much better than they used to be, um, you know they're not they're not not easy and um she had a, well, in the course of that conversation i remember something else that she said about how amazing and wonderful it is that um among uh, palestinian filmmakers women make up 40 percent of filmmakers and in hollywood or western europe it's more like 10 percent or three percent and and this is a, is a kind of example of what I mean about the, um, the very special qualities of 
of Palestinian women, which arise from not just the situation they're in now, but the situation as it's been since since Balfour, if you like, but certainly since 48. Mm, that's true. So we've got a comment from Ronit that we've answered the question and she, she gave a very uh, good statement, which is, you know, examples like this and production of film and, and then writing books uh, about Palestine means that, you know, the Palestinian native will not disappear, so to speak, against the colonizer you know, the language of uh, post-colonial studies. Um, but we are, we're coming almost to the end of our time. Um, if you want to say something uh, that you want to end this with, and I wonder whether Nargis wants to come in or is, you're okay? Do you, do you have any question? I just mesmerized. It's such a new world. I mean, I see parallels of that with Iran in a different angle. The fact that the uh, poets and increasingly filmmakers are the voice of the oppressed and so it's a very different situation to Palestine obviously this is a self-inflicted uh, you know atrocity but uh, the camera is um, an extraordinary tribune for bringing the you know voice of just you know not physically necessarily oppressed in camps but in isolation that the uh, artists and invariably women face and it's and there's a dignity with which they present their work it is this is not outrageous there might be seizing um frustrations and anger but this power to reflect and to hold back and it's not immediately subjective but it's very potent so i'm amazed my i am rushing to get your book and i'm <laughs> rushing to certainly see this film it's, it's been inspiring thank you so much i mean really it's been such a pleasure listening to this thank you Nargis. and do you want to say something victoria to end this yeah i'd just like to end with somebody else's words um the palestinian filmmaker very successful filmmaker um hani abu assad said mm -hmm. about may i love may's work in fact she's one of the reasons i became a director myself <laughs> and i just think that's so perfect yeah. Good for him. We want to thank you for, uh, you know, writing this book, for bringing it to the attention, bringing May's work to the attention of, you know, different audiences. It's really important to have stuff like this. And also for the style that you followed in writing the book. I noticed that each chapter starts with an abstract and then you have the, you know, the discussion about the film and you interweave uh, a little bit of May's life story into the discussion. And it makes it both um, kind of uh, intimate, but also uh, easy to follow, but also raises all these questions that we talked about today. The question of, you know, the need to talk about uh, lives, the need to keep talking, and the need to uh, make visible um, the voices of women, of men, and of, uh, of people who are living under a very difficult situation. So thank you very much. Thank you for joining us and for being uh, so, uh, you know, wonderful in your discussion and eloquent. So- Thank you, Dina, very much for hosting me. Thanks for the audience. We're sorry we cannot see you. Yes, we're sorry. <laughs> this is the nature of technologies and uh, hopefully we, we will see you at the next event, which will be next week. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, thank you Dina. Thank you. <laughs>